Perfect. Did it work? Cool. Yes, we got it. Everyone's there you go. Asleep. Everyone from asleep? No? no, I don't think so. Cool. All right, go ahead. Um, so, yeah, so those who haven't been, so basically, I'm sorry, introduce myself. I'm Chris Myers. I'm export director at Parma, based, in, uh, based here in, in Bordeaux. Um, so I've been at Parma for about six, seven years. Uh, been in the wine business for a long time, hence the grey hair. Um, so basically, Palmer, in a nutshell, a bit of history behind the property. So uh, the property used to be called Domaine de Gasque, uh, belonged to a big Bordeaux family called the de Gasque family up until 1814, when uh, Mr. de Gasque died, and his wife was on her way up to Paris to sell the chateau and met a, uh, a dashing major, a British, um, major general called Charles Palmer who was on his way up to Bath. He was a member of the parliament in Bath. Um, and he was, they met on a horse, uh, horse a stagecoach, and they spent three days together between Bordeaux and Paris, and she managed to persuade Charles Palmer to buy the chateau. We're not quite sure what happened during those three days, but she managed to persuade him, and, um, and he bought the property in 1814. Um, never actually lived the property. Um, he, he was a member of Parliament in Bath and spoke, spent most of his time in the UK uh, promoting Palmer, which is why it's big, a big brand now in the UK. Um, he unfortunately went bankrupt uh, and, and sold the property to uh, the French banks in 1843, who bought, who bought it and owned the property for about 10 years. Uh, 1853, two French brothers bought the chateau, the Pereira brothers, of Portuguese origin, Pereira. Um, and they owned the chateau for about 80 years. They built the chateau, as you uh, today, there we go. So they built the chateau in about a year, uh, 1853, 1854. Um, they unfortunately went bankrupt as well. Um, they had problems with mildew, odium, First World War, stock crash the 20s. And the late 30s, they sold to four friends. Uh, for um, wine merchant friends, uh, and two of the friends are still owners today. Um, so the four friends were Marlebes and Sichel family, who still own the chateau, and the others were Ginesté, who sold their shares to buy our neighbour uh, Chateau Margaux, um, and Miai family, who sold their shares over the years. Um, they had um, they used to own Pichon Comtesse, and they own Couffrand and Siran in in the Medoc. Um, so today we have two families. Um, fourth generation of shareholders. Um, we have 66 hectares, so an acre is about 200 acres, 210 acres. Uh, we officially produce two wines, uh, Chateau and Alter Ego. Uh, we only produce five wines, we can maybe talk about those uh, afterwards. Um, so no a normal production for us is between 10 and 12,000 cases of each wine, so about 300,000 bottle production. Um, if there's one thing to remember after all my blurb is that we have a lot of uh, Merlot in, in, at the property. Um, as you know, left bank, right bank, I'm not sure how much you don't know, the Bordeaux, Bordeaux in general, I'll maybe explain a bit about Bordeaux. So Bordeaux spent on two main areas, left bank of the river and right bank. Uh, on the right bank is saint emilion Pomerol, entre deux mer which is a very cool clay limestone soil, um, which has come from the center of France, which is why Merlot King Grape for us right bank. On the left bank where we are, uh, in the Margot Appellation, um, it's a very warm, uh, deep gravel soil, which come from originally from the Pyrenees a million years ago, one and a half million years ago. So Merlot loves cool soil, Cabernet Sauvignon loves warm soil, um, so if we followed our soil structure um, at, at Palmer, we should have 95% Cabernet, 5% Merlot. In fact, you have a split 50-50 Merlot cab. So you have precisely 47% Cabernet Sauvignon and 6% of a third grape variety called Petit Verdot, um, which gives spiciness and colour to the wine. Um, so two wines um, officially. Um, we are biodynamic. Uh, we started um, moving across to organic or biodynamic farming 
uh, in 2009 with one hectare, not really knowing what we were doing, but we knew it was the, the way forward. Uh, carry on treating the soil like we have done for the last 50, 50 years since after the war. Uh, we're slowly killing the, all, the all the chemicals, pesticides, herbicides. So we decided to test out uh, one hectare of organic um, yard farming in 2009. Uh, we did a blind taste between the organic and non-organic, and strictly no difference at all. Uh, so we decided to slowly move the whole property ac across to biodynamic farming. Uh, we were 60% biodynamic in 2013. Uh, 13 for us is what we call a um, complicated vintage. Uh, we never have vintages, we never have good or complicated ones. And 2013 was a very, very tough vintage, very challenging, a huge amount of botrytis because of the, of the wet weather we had in September, October. Um, we still managed to make a wine, even though we were 60% biodynamic. So in 2014, we decided to take the step to move across to 100% biodynamic. So 14 was our first vintage, 100% bio, uh, dynamic, and we were certified in 2018. The next vintage on the market will be our certified, our first certified uh, vintage. Um, that's the, the winemaking side, or the, the vineyard side, sorry. Uh, the winemaking side, uh, in between 2009, 2010, we had a major kind of revamp of the, of the property. Um, so the village was redone as used to be in the 19th century. When you come to Palmy, you'll see it. Um, and we redid the technical facilities. Uh, we now have uh, two uh, vat rooms, uh, one major one plus a, a smaller one, smaller tanks. So we have about 60 tanks now and about 60 plots in the vineyard. So we can do plot modification, sweet variety, it's kept separate during winemaking. It's only blended once it's in barrel. Um, one major thing that's happened in winemaking uh, is the fact that we do sulfur-free alcoholic fermentation now. So in the olden days, we used to add, which everyone does, add four grams per hectolitre of sulfur to kill the bacteria. So sulfur is an antioxidant, antiseptic. Um, so we stopped using sulfur for winemaking. So we do what we call... In French, Akosh, you might have to help me. It's called a pied de cuve. Is it a mother yeast, I guess, in English? Yeah, um, something like that. I don't actually don't drink Mother know. yeast, yes. Yeah. So we basically pick, pick uh, some grapes a week before harvest. Um, and uh, we kickstart fermentation with the yeast around the, around the grapes. Uh, and with that uh, first family of yeast, we kickstart the first tank of fermentation. So as the grapes come out, we have a, an optical sorter. So as the grapes are coming out of so the infrared imaging, um, we're filling up small tanks with grapes and our own yeast. The big tanks are being filled up and once, and basically we warm the tanks up and once the, uh, the tanks are warm, fermentation kickstarts automatically. So no sulfur is used at all. Um, we're not making sulfur free wines. We're not making natural wines or whatever. We're not ready for that yet because um, our wines have to be stable. Um, so the first time we add sulfur is after malolactic fermentation in, in barrels. Um, so we're trying to reduce the amount of sulfur in our wines by half, getting down to kind of 50, 60 milligrams of litre, um, per, per litre of sulfur, which is enough to kind of stabilise the wine and for the first 10 years uh, ageing. So that's a big, a, big, a big step in the whole winemaking. So biodynamic in the vineyard and, and sulfur-free alcoholic fermentation um, uh, in, in the cellar. Um, talking about the classification of, of Parma, uh, you know, the 1855, the infamous 1855 classification uh, when Napoleon wanted um, the courtier, the, 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 the brokers to, to classify the 60 or 70 or 65 um, um, best wines in Bordeaux into five families. And it was basically done on price. So the first gross, second gross, third, fourth, fifths. Um, the first, as you know, Lafitte, Latour, Margot, uh, Bouillon, etc. Uh, and we were classified a third growth in 1855 because we just come out of uh, having been owned by a bankers uh, who hadn't really invested in, into the chateau at all. Uh, so the wine, the, chateau, the, the price of the, of, the, of the wine in 1855 was probably less expensive than it is now. Uh, and we were classified a third growth. Uh, um, 
yeah, we think it's a very good third growth, but we're still classified third. Uh, the classification nowadays means less than it used to in the olden days. Um, just really, people don't really buy Parma because we're a third growth or because we're a great wine. It's just, you know, people buy Parma because it's because of the brand and, and the quality of the, of the wine. Um, Akosh, what else do we need to talk about? Well, you need to at least mention two of the non-official wines that you make. I will mention two of the non-official. I was waiting for your question, Akosh. <laughs> so, I'll, um, actually, I'll try, I'll try and be clever uh, and try and... So, this is our main wine, Chateau Palma. Um, so say production between 10 to 12,000 cases, um, high percentage of Merlot, but most, most of our wines have between 45 and 55% uh, Merlot or Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, and the rest is um, uh, uh, Petit Verlot. We're huge fans of, of Petit Verlot. Um, and the next... So Alter Ego is uh, a wine that we make, we started making in 1998. Um, so as you know, properties have first wines and second wines. Uh, so basically, a second wine is there anything they use that don't make into the first wine. So it's um, a second wine. Uh, Alter Ego is it's not, just, it's not a second wine, it's what we call a, another wine at Parma. Um, so you have 66 hectares. So one third of the property is dedicated to Parma. One third is dedicated to Alter Ego, and one third of the property, about 20 hectares, is basically can be Parma or Alter Ego. So every year we'll be tasting the grapes for two or three weeks um, before the harvest. And basically what we're looking for is the, sweet, the sweetness, the freshness, the crunchiness. Those grapes will go into Alter Ego. Uh, and the bigger, bolder structure, the, the bigger uh, backbone wines will go into, um, will go into Parma. Um, so we, we basically, if you, we always like to compare wine and, and, and music. We always compare uh, Palmer's more the classical style uh, and uh, Alter Ego's more the jazzy, funky style. Um, at the end of the, we're talking about the two other wines we don't really officially produce, but we do. Um, one is called Vin Blanc de Palmer. I shall try and find it here. Okay. One's called Vin Blanc de Palmer, it's obviously a white wine. Uh, late 90s, we were rebuilding in one of our cellars and we stumbled across two bottles of 1925 white wine from Palmer. So we used to produce white wine in the olden days, in very, very small quantities. Uh, um, so we decided to, uh, to, to replant uh, old grape varieties in 2004. Um, you know, the main grape varieties in, in Bordeaux are um, Sauvignon and Simillon, um, which would have been the easy grape variety to plant, but we didn't. We decided to do something different for historical reasons. So we planted just over one, about 1.2 hectares um, of um, Muscadelle, 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 uh, Sauvignon Gris, it's a grey Sauvignon, which is actually a pink grape variety. And we brought some, um, um, a few vines back um, from the south of, southwest of France um, called Lozé, which hopefully no one knows unless you're real wine nerds. So Lozé is an uh, a unknown grape variety. There are three or four hectares left in Jurançon in the Pyrenees, uh, which is where we went to get the, the grapes, or the, the, the vines at least. So we have um, about two or three rows of Lozé, which we're not allowed to plant in Bordeaux. You know, Bordeaux, Bordeaux we have, um, we're allowed to use six or seven, six red grape varieties and seven white grape varieties. And Lozé is not one of them. So we, our, our white wine gets declassified as a, um, used to be called table wine, now it's a Vin de France. So we produce 2,000 bottles a year. We keep 1,000 bottles back at the property, which we share with our lovely customers. Um, and, and we sell a thousand bottles into the market, but only for on-premise, only for restaurants and, and hotels. Um, just a tiny production. We do it more for fun. Um, the wine's a great wine. We think so the first vintage was planted in 2004, first vintage 2007, and we started distributing it on the market um, uh, in 2013. 
Um, so we produce a, a very small amount just for just for top end up end restaurants and, and hotels in the world. Um, and the other wine we produce is uh, called historical nineteenth century wine, which is there. Looks like Palmer, but it's not. Uh, so our CEO and winemaker, analogist, agronomist, uh, a guy called Thomas Duroux, um, he, um, his wife is American. He was in San Francisco for a big tasting. I met a guy who, who brought along an old bottle of 1869 Palmer, um, which, they, um, which they tried together and they guessed the wine it was Hermitage, Hermitage from Northern Rhone. So in the olden days, they used to add, um, the expensive wines used to add Syrah to the wines from Bordeaux and Burgundy. Um, because they were pretty too scared of picking the grapes too late, they used they pretty pick the grapes too early, and the wines were sometimes green and insipid. So the expensive wines, they'd add Syrah from, from Northern Rhone. The cheaper wines in Bordeaux and Burgundy, they'd go to Algeria, bring some wine back, give a bit of, a bit of oomph to the wine. Um, so Thomas came back in 2005. We were just blending the 2004 vintage. And he, did, he, uh, he convinced the shareholders to, to produce three or 400 cases of a wine called historical 19th century wine. So Thomas really wanted um, the Palmer label, but because it's a table wine, because we're blending Syrah from Northern Rhone, 10% Syrah, 45% Merlot and 45% Cab from our property. Um, we're not allowed to do it, obviously. So it's a bit like the white wine, our wine gets declassified. Um, so we're again a, a, a Van der Haas, a table wine. Um, we produce three or 400 cases a year, which gets sold through the Place de Bordeaux um, and sold to mostly private customers. But some, some restaurants have um, restaurants uh, on trade and, and, and hotels have the uh, historical as well. So there's a lot of spiciness. It's kind of a strange wine. It has a lot of spiciness from the from the Syrah uh, and the softness from the Merlot and the structure from the Cabernet. So it's, it's a wine that's... Um, it's fun to make. Um, we make, so the first vintage was 2004. Uh, we made every two or three years between three or 400 cases, depending if we can find the Syrah from the Northern Rhine. And also depends if it blends well with, with Merlot and Cab, which isn't necessarily always the case. So we did 2004, 2006, 2007, 2010, 2013, 14, and 16. Um, one of the fifth unofficial wine, which we don't really make, is uh, there, are actually, there are actually six now, but I won't mention the sixth one. But um, the fifth one is, is actually in 2004, we planted, the white, we planted a, um, a fourth white grape variety called Merlot Blanc, white Merlot, uh, which in the first vintage of white wine was actually used. And we didn't find after tasting the wine, once it had been blended, the Merlot Blanc added anything to the, to the blend, to the wine. Um, so instead of ripping the one and a half, vine, one and a half rows we had, uh, we decided to make a, a Van de Paille, a straw wine. As you know, two ways of making sweet wines, either you leave the wine, the grapes on the vine, or you pick them and you, you lie them on beds, and, um, and which is what we do at Palmo. So we pick the grapes uh, from Merlot Blanc early September. It doesn't work every year, and we dry them in beds uh, in, in the property at the Chateau, and they dry for a a month, two months, and it's a very, very slow uh, barrel fermented um, uh, wine making process, which we, we've never ever sold a single bottle or a, a bottle's never left our, our chateau. So you have to come to Parma, have lunch, and, um, and we'll taste the, uh, the Van der Bay, which is, um, which is a great, um, it's a great product. It's a great product. So we have, we have fun, 99.9% uh, of our wines um, are, are Palmer, Chateau de Palmer, and uh, Ultrigo. Good. Well done. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. So sir. now, if you have questions, just please unmute your microphone, ask your question, and then mute it again. Nice questions, please. Nice ones. Hello. Um, I was wondering um, why you are declassifying for, uh, for Van de Pays if Bordeaux AOC has got Merlot Blanc as allowed grape varieties? The, 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 the wine that's declassified is called Historical 19th Century Wine. So it's a blend of 45% Merlot, 45% Cabernet, which we're obviously allowed to you, the and 10%... 
I'm so sorry. The sorry? very last one that you are adding Merlot Blanc. Because as far as I'm aware, the Merlot Blanc is allowed in Bordeaux. Okay, Bordeaux there, okay there, are two, there are two separate subjects. The, 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 the Merlot Blanc is, it was used for um, a, a wine that we don't even bottle, we, we don't even uh, put a label on. Okay. So that's not declassified. That's just, there's, 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 there's called Vin de Paille de Palmer. There's no label, there's no capsules, it's put in a bottle and we drink it to the chateau. So that's not declassified. The wines that are declassified are our white wine, the dry white wine, which um, uh, Muscadelle, which we're allowed to use, Sauvignon Gris, which we're allowed to use, and the third grape variety is called Lozé, which we're not allowed to use. So that's declassified. The other wine that's declassified is the Palmer Historical 19th century wine, which is 45% Merlot and, and Cabernet Sauvignon, which we can obviously use. And we bring in some Syrah, which we go and buy in the Northern Rhone, and that we're not allowed to do. So that's declassified. But our, our Merlot Blanc, you're absolutely right, Merlot Blanc, we're allowed to use Merlot Blanc. And that's not declassified because it's not even a, it's just a, a wine that we bottle for our, our personal consumption. I wanted to ask you why you decided to go for, the, uh, um, for a biodynamic now, when I've heard that the humidity is rising in Bordeaux and brings even a little bit more problems. Second question is a who classified you? Is it Demeter or is it any other organization? that sort okay. of frozen. I'll answer your second question first because I've got really bad short-term memory. Um, Demeter. Okay. We're certified Demeter. Uh, and your first question was what? <laughs> and the first question is why you have decided to go for biodynamic now. Yes. If Bordeaux's got a record of having a l larger amount of humidity than it was having before, mm -hmm. so it might bring you even a little bit more problems. Yeah, yeah, a, a fantastic question. Fantastic question. You're right. I mean, ba basically, Bordeaux, the word Bordeaux, Bordeaux, is next to the water. Uh, Medoc, uh, Media Aque, uh, between two seas, so between the, the, the Atlantic coast and, and the Gironde River, uh, estuary at least. So, Bordeaux, it rains a lot. It's really humid. It's like 30% more rainfall than Burgundy or, or Germany, etc. So, it, it, it's tough. Um, it sounds a strange move wanting, wanting to move across to organic and biodynamic farming. Um, we believe it's the future. You know, there are huge amounts of, I mean, just in the, in the vineyard workers in, in general in the world, uh, huge amounts of cancers. Um, the soil now, when you actually you walk through the vineyard, the soil actually smells of something. It smells of soil. Um, mm -hmm. So basically, it's, it's, it's bringing life back into, into the vineyard. Um, and you're right, I mean, it's, it's tough, it's tough. Um, um, a great example is 2018 vintage. Uh, we lost 65% of our production. Uh, no alter ego was made, we made 50% less Parma. Um, but then there are vintages like 2019, uh, where we made as much, as much wine as anybody who wasn't um, um, organic or biodynamic. Um, so it's, it's not easy, uh, but we believe it's the future for the, for the, for the soil, for the soil of vineyard workers, um, it's pretty uncommercial of me to say it, but we're not at all doing it for the consumer. Uh, the consumer comes way at the end of the list of the reasons to moving across to biodynamic farming. Um, but it's not easy. I mean, there are more and more properties testing organic and biodynamic farming in Bordeaux. Um, but it's pretty the worst place to, to, to be organic, but, you know, um, invested in, 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 you know, um, more staff. We have to be able to treat the vineyards with copper and sulfur pretty quickly. We have uh, we 200 sheep, we have, so we have three or four people looking after the sheep, we have 12 cows, we have um, two dogs, Ben and Hip Hop. I mean, it's, it's, it's an investment, um, but the, so the, we're doing it for the soil, for the vineyard workers uh, to make a better wine. Uh, and then last but not least, well last um, is for the consumer. Um, but it's not easy, you're right. It's not easy being, being organic in Bordeaux, but it's, um, we believe in the future believe in the future and if you carry on treating with pesticides herbicides fungicides one day your soil's going to die and making wine with dead soils not easy it's not easy so i have a question um i have witnessed it over the past in other regions um the, when they went uh, organic and biodynamic and mainly when they went really biodynamic um that uh, clearly there was a loss of yield between the scale of anywhere between 20 and 40 percent uh, overall on the estate and i'm not just uh, saying that because of the uh, weather 
uh, and Tampere, you know, when, uh, you know, you have bad weather one year or the other. It's just simply equal amount of uh, equal, equal conditions resulted in less yields anyway. Uh, but the quality, uh, uh, which I have seen in certain states, have significantly gone up after they have turned uh, biodynamic. Um, yeah. What do you guys see? I mean, obviously, 18 was a disaster, but uh, otherwise... The wine's great, though. <laughs> yeah, of course. Whatever is left is good, right? <laughs> the wine's good. No, no, I mean, we, we, so we, moved, we moved across to, to 100% biodynamic in, in 2014. Um, we've seen a change in the wine. Is the wine better today because of biodynamic? To be honest, it's way too early to say, uh, yeah, our wine's much better because of biodynamic. That is not necessarily true. It's not true. Um, we find there's more, there's more freshness, more pureness. There's, there's more droiture. It's like straight down the line. And more freshness uh, in the wine. Is it because, um, is it because we're biodynamic? Is it because we're spending a lot more time in the vineyard? Is it because, I don't know, we, we think it's because of the work we're doing in the vineyard um, gives, gives a different style to the wine, gives more freshness, more elegance. Um, yeah, the, the, the aim is to make a better wine. I was, I was in South Africa a few, a few months ago and I was speaking to a biodynamic winemaker and he's been biodynamic 15 years. And he said, yeah, I'm starting to see a difference in the wine. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a long, it's a long-term vision. Uh, for me to say today, yeah, yeah, wines are much better because we're organic or biodynamic. Yeah, I think it's a bit of, um, I, w I wouldn't be telling the truth, but there's something, there's something going on in the wines. There's something going on in the wines. Um, production is lower. <sighs> yeah, if, if you average out over, over, over 10 years, production is not necessarily that much lower at all. Obviously, vintages like 2018, um, when we're down to 11 hectolitres per hectare, when we're normally, we're kind of 35, 36 hectolitres per hectare. Um, then 2019, yeah, we're, we're 46 hectolitres per hectare. So, you know, I think the soil needs time the, the, to get used to, 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 to what's going on and, and, and the vines need, need to get used to it. Um, but say again, it's a long-term vision. It's a long-term vision. I have another question, I'm sorry. But I have a question, how is your response for a copper toxicity in Bordeaux? Um, which is quite high these days uh, due to uh, using a uh, lot of Bouy Baudelaire and uh, generally copper. And mm -hmm. um, I wanted, shall I just like do another questions after? I don't want to also take another. Uh, I've got a pen. I've got a pen. Yeah. Go and ahead, another question. You mentioned that you are not using any sulfur uh, prior to a fermentation. Yeah. Uh, is, is it because also a biodynamic uh, transition? Because I've heard that generally when there is a high organic content, the grapes are grown uh, in a very sort of friendly, natural way. I've heard that it's, re it's very well reflected on the stability of the fermentation, usually starts slowlier, does not go through uh, such a turbid uh, sort of procedure. I'll ask your first question. Uh, copper in the soil, yeah, touchy subject. Um, uh, from the outside, from the inside, it's not touchy at all. Um, Bouille Bordelaise, which is copper, border mixture, um, yeah. it's called. It's basically copper. Um, we use to, to get rid of mildew and, and various other things. Um, you say a lot's been used. I, I, I kind of wouldn't really agree with you. I, I think in the olden days, when, when I was at wine school years ago, um, uh, the vineyard around, basically vineyards in Bordeaux were blue. They used to spray between 25 and 30, he 30 kilos per hectare of sulfur, in the, of copper, sorry, in the olden days. So the vineyard was basically blue. Uh, nowadays, in biodynamic farming, we're allowed kind of between four and a half and five kilos per hectare per year. Um, we're doing experiments. We have a big R&D team. We have about four or five people in our R&D team. Um, and funny enough, I was speaking to them last week. Our maximum we, we've um, never gone over is four kilos per hectare, which is minimal compared to the olden days. Um, and we're doing experiments on seeing what, what needs to be done to reduce the copper. Uh, we're, do, we're doing experiments on, on, on a couple of plots where we have 100% copper and 80% uh, copper. And in fact, we see that the 80% copper has exactly the same or, or um, less problems than, than the 100%. So we're doing all we can to see what we can do to reduce the amount of copper which is obviously a heavy metal, which is a big subject. Um, but saying, you know, we're, we're spraying a lot of copper. 
it, it's minimal and, and it's, yeah, but we're doing a lot of work to see what we can do to get less, you know, reach under three, two kilos per hectare, which, which would be great. But in biodynamic, we're allowed, it's 15, spread, it's 15 kilos over three years. It's basically five kilos per, per hectare. But it's, it's a subject we, we're, we're looking closely at. Um, the sulfur, the sulfur, yeah, the sulfur was basically um, linked or sulfur-free alcoholic fermentation. Um, is is yeah as part of the biodynamic bi biodynamic thing, but it's it's really to seeing um, it's it's really for the, more for the wine we're doing it more than the whole biodynamic process. Um, we're seeing there's more freshness and more elegance in the wines. Um, we we can control we can control the the, the fermentation easier as well. Is it because the, the grapes are coming in as you say because the biodynamic grapes are coming in that easy to control. Um, but we just we just feel that um, we we can't do pre maceration pre cold um, um, maceration pre fermentation pre fermentary maceration um, because we haven't got any sulfur in the wines in the grapes at least so we have to be pretty quick but once the fermentation starts it's really much easier to control with with a lot less um, with well, with with um, with, um, with our yeast our natural yeast inside if that answers your question. Uh, Anybody else would like to ask a question? Thanks, Lucas. Okay, if no one else is asking, there's a last question that I would like to ask, and this is, I just finished. I can see that Ernesto is uh, raising the hand. So just very last questions. Well, now um, I, I've read that there is more and more white wine brought in Medoc, which is technically not allowed to produce any white wine or is allowed to produce with the classified form. The old trend was generally the wine that is very oaky, is very full. Is the trend slightly changing in Bordeaux to produce a little bit fresher white wines? Completely. Yeah, yeah. Oak. Completely. The, um, the, the... I mean, Bordeaux wine production, white wine production is still very, very small. Um, you're right, some, some of the old white wines have been big, butchy, tannic, uh, very oaky style. Um, the style now of, of, of the white wines um, uh, are much softer, more elegant wines. Um, we, we barrel ferment, um, actually, we, we um, foudre in big, big, big big barrels we ferment in big big um, barrels um, and aging is either done in either not done in barrels or we use really old barrels more for the exchange more than, than for, for the tannins and, and, and style that the, 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 that the barrels will give um, so I think the styles now of, of white wine people are looking for more elegance and freshness and softness and, and not your big in your face um, uh, oaky oaky wines which uh, which is again this is, the old style of, of wine making, but uh, things are f making slightly so softer, elegant wines. Ernesto, you had a question? Just uh, yes, yeah, just a quick question actually about uh, the production. Uh, um, for the historical use, the Syrah. The first question on that is: Is that the produce of the Syrah in the Côte d'Or always the same? Um, it always comes from a or it comes from a different uh, producer, grower. Mm -hmm. And also, it's known that some of the big chateaus, including Margot, they also produce um, bulk wines, which they sell without the names to other producers and so on. Do you do the same, or is just yeah. something well, that you, you want to mix with? No, Thank we, you. We, yeah, we basically, basically um, um, uh, the... We, we sell between zero and 10% of our wines to various négociants who, who make their branded Margot generics. So it gets lost in the whole wine world. So it's basically, we don't have a third wine. Um, so we use the grapes that we, we don't go into the Alter Ego or Parma. We sell off as bulk, so that happens. Not every year, but it does happen. Um, and you'll... First question regarding Syrah is, I have no idea where the Syrah comes from. Um, that's true. Um, it's a kind of a, when I started working at Palmer, 
I was working for the, for the family before, so for the Marla Best families, Negociant. Uh, and Thomas, I used to go up to him and, and say, so where, where, where's the syrup? Where does it come from? And Thomas is half Italian. He said, oh, what's not important? What's important is the product. It's not important where the, wine, where the syrup comes from. So I spent years trying to find out where the syrup came from. I have no idea. And on my first day working full time at Palmer in 2013, I said, you know, Thomas and I were working together. Where, where's the syrup? Where does it come from? He said, ah, it's not important. What's important is the product. So I still have no idea. Um, all I know is that it's come from, it's come from two, uh, it's come from the same producer twice. Um, and it changes every, every two or three years. Uh, it's okay. been the same guy twice. Um, and it's, to be honest, I mean, it's 10% of the production. So it's like two barrels of, of wine that we, we buy. Um, so there are only four people who actually know where it comes from. So it's Thomas. Our CEO, uh, the producer of of, uh, of wine in in in, in, the, in the Rhone, uh, the guy bringing the two barrels back, driver, and our accountant who pays the bill. Of course. <laughs> All right. Thank you. That, that's really... <laughs> I'm sorry. I have, no, I have no idea what to say, but that's yeah, it. Yeah. So, is it from Hermitage itself? Because that's the right, the, the word Hermitage in the old. Hermitage, the exactly. Wine. In that, it was from Hermitage in 2004, and now it's from Northern Rhone. So it's a uh, good on septentrional. Septentrional good you Okay, so it's not so it's not from the the hill of Hermitage itself. No, because if not it'd be easy to guess where it came from. Yeah. There yeah. aren't many producers. No, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Any more questions, please? If you have any questions afterwards, you think of something just Akosh has my details, you can just pop an email to Akosh or give me a call or whatever and get my details off him and we can uh, I can answer. Okay. Well, if you have no more questions, then I will thank you very much for participating to this call, and thank you, Chris, for your time. Thank you. Thank you all for listening, and yeah, and please come and see come come and see us at the property. <laughs> Let's try to well. get. Don't all, don't all come at once, but yeah. So we hope. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope we'll be able to travel at some point, at least this year. Yeah, yeah. It'll be fine. All right, guys. Have a good one. Thank, Thank, you Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Oh.